Hello everyone, this is Mia here with another episode of the 101 Thoughts podcast. This episode will be focused on how the design elements included in hospitals can actually impact the health and recovery of patients. Today, I am joined by our special guest, Dr. Upali Nanda, who specializes in healthcare design. She is a director of research for a global architectural firm called HKS Incorporated. She is also an associate professor of practice at the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. There, Dr. Nanda teaches a class titled Health by Design. In this class, students learn how to link design and health outcomes through the use of techniques such as evidence-based design. Dr. Nanda has been widely recognized in the healthcare design community, so I'm excited to speak with her about some of the important topics within this field. Welcome, Dr. Nanda, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad you could be here. Before we begin, for our listeners, if you want to give a brief introduction just about yourself, what you do. Sure. So my name is Upali Nanda. I am a pracademic, which means I have one foot in practice and one foot in academia. I serve as the director of research for a global architecture firm called HKS. I also serve as the Associate Professor of Practice here at the Taubman School of Architecture. I have an adjunct position at the School of Public Health. And my work really has been for many, many years now at the intersection of the built environment and human perception with a particular focus on health. Great. So what kind of brought you into this field? What interested you in this area? When I was studying architecture, back in my undergraduate in India, I was always fascinated by the experiential component, by the human component, by how we experienced the spaces that were designed. And often there's a mismatch between the design intent and the experienced impact. So that became a bit of an obsession with me, I think. I became very interested, for example, in non-visual components, on sensory components. Because a lot of the experience is not something that you can capture in photographs or drawings or visual artifacts. And that led me to pursuing my master's and then my PhD. My doctoral work was all around synesthetics about the sensory components of design and how we really frame our own perceptions, how we look at architecture, how we feel architecture how we interact with spaces and the environment and everything that happens in between, between the human and the environment. What what is that? That in-between space became an area of fascination with me. I got very interested in neuroscience, uh, investigated a lot at the intersection of neuroscience and architecture, became involved in the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture that I sit on the board of now. And that entire intersection of where humans meet environments and vice versa, because today we live in times where environments can be responsive to human needs. They don't have to be static. They can be dynamic. But to what purpose? And the purpose that seems to really underlie all of our work at the end of the day is health. It's human health. It's physical health. It's mental health. It's fiscal health. And so health became an area that... uh, I almost fell into. I didn't start with being fascinated by health, but when you keep digging deeper, it seems to be what drives us. At the end of the day, that's what we want. We want health and well-being. And um, from that work, right after my doctoral work, I really got involved with health and healthcare, always anchored on the human perception component of it, worked uh, with healthcare art, worked with healthcare architecture, worked with the Center for Health Design. And then now when I joined HKS as a director of research, it became an underlying theme to all of the work, looking at the impact, the intersection of design and outcomes and always thinking about health outcomes as the true north that we were striving towards. All right. Thank you. I think it's really interesting to kind of see how the health and the architecture kind of interact with each other. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that at first glance. You know, it's funny that when I was uh, in school, I still remember the first time I heard the term evidence-based design. And I was very skeptical. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like uh, 
it, knowledge based is still okay. How can we really be evidence based? Design is so iterative and evolves all the time, and it's not prescriptive. What does it mean to be evidence based? And over time, with some of my own research, when I started seeing the impact, the measurable impact that design can have on health, I realized that we have an ethical duty to look at the evidence, to investigate. Like if you're going to have an impact, you have to investigate what that impact is. And if indeed by changing how you design environments, you can change even an iota of health, then we need to do that. And in that Maybe I was lucky, like the very first job that I did right out of school was with an art firm doing research on the impact of art on health. And in those early days, just seeing, uh, I mean, there was a study we did that was in the Journal of uh, Mental Health, where we showed that simply exposing young women who were in a holding room, in a psychiatric holding room, waiting for diagnosis, simply changing the artwork on the walls reduce the amount of anxiety medication that needed to be prescribed for them pro renata. So the PRN medication rate changed just because we put some healing art on the walls. And we did a business case for that. We found out that we were actually saving the hospital $30,000 by putting just one simple piece of healing art. Now, that was a very small study. We don't know how scalable it is. It obviously has its own limitations. But, but think of that. Think of just the power of art as a non-pharmaceutical intervention to change our health and well-being. And the power of art is because of the power of the mind. And eventually, that's, that's what it comes down to, that we have to look at the physical and the mental together. And, and those little studies, for me, throughout my career, I have always been very skeptical. I've always been the biggest devil's advocate of my own work. It's, um, I'm always trying to look at it from the other side and say, does it really make sense? And I, I came at this field skeptical. I came at this field saying, I'm not sure that design can really make a difference. But time and time again, with the studies we did, like this one on art, we did a lot of studies with cancer patients. You'll see a body of evidence that has really been growing over time. And it's reached a point where you understand that the environment can help and the environment can help without really leaning so much on pharmacological interventions. And that's powerful. That, that feels like almost an ethical directive of all of us in the design field aspiring towards. Yeah, I think that's all very, very fascinating. So kind of going along with that research that you've performed, are there any other findings that you have come across in other studies and things like that other than just artwork? Sure. So when I started, I started, and my doctoral work was not about healthcare, right? It was about the intersection of human mind and environment, and very much focused on synesthetics. And then after my doctoral work, I plunged straight into healthcare and did a lot of these healthcare studies. So the studies that I was describing about art, we did a lot of work, for example, on the cathartic power of art with people suffering from PTSD. We did work with children and how it could reduce their anxiety and anxious behaviors uh, in pediatric environments. And then as we start looking at architecture, we found that how the layout of spaces can really improve efficiency, uh, layout of spaces can improve effectiveness, simple visibility, what nurses can see at any given point in time that is really a design element can impact mortality. So there's a huge link in terms of how we design our environments and the health outcomes overall. There was a study that's very, very famous by Roger Ulrich back in 1984, that almost started this entire field in a way, which compared patients in a hospital over eight years, one wing that faced a park and one wing had a window that looked into a brick wall. And they found over time that those patients who lived in a wall with a window recovered faster, had fewer painkillers given to them, had fewer negative notes made about them, and that's just a window, right? And that has now changed policy to the extent that today you can't have a patient room without a window, right? So over time, this research has become policy. In our own work, uh, there's one study I, I remember very fondly, which was a study we did with nurses right here in ProMedica, actually. 
And we were studying uh, visibility, walking distances, nurse experience. And we found that a single med event, the act of giving one pill to a patient, if indeed in the act of giving the patient the pill, the patient might throw up, might actually have an adverse reaction of some sort to it, or just need more water or need a snack. For all of those things together, a single nurse might walk 1.2 miles for one medication event, right? Imagine how much nurses are walking all day long. And we did a lot of studies and we found that nurses walk almost five to six times more than they need to because of the way spaces are designed. And uh, we, for the design team, we actually called it the applesauce moment because we found the biggest amount of wasteful walking was the amount they were walking to just give a patient a small box of applesauce to have with their medicine. And it was a simple design thing that they had to do about putting medication supplies and nutrition next to each other. It wasn't rocket science, but unless we had observed people in their setting, unless we took more of an anthropological perspective to it, really, really see what does a life in the day of a nurse look like, we wouldn't have gotten that insight. And that has now changed how we plan hospitals overall. So you'll see a lot of research on hospital layouts, a lot of research on patient rooms. Uh, there's still a debate on where the toilet should go, because what's the most beneficial for patients? What's the most beneficial for nurses and care providers? How do they interact? What happens in a typical ICU, for example, at a single point in time, you might have 12 people, 12 to 14 people in the room. When you're dealing with crisis, how do you design for that? So a lot of thinking about this field is thinking about it almost like theater. And you have to understand the script. You have to understand the play. You have to understand the different scenarios. And then you have to set the stage. And the built environment is literally the stage on which our life gets played out. So for healthcare, where it really, really matters, um, it, it's, it's very important to pay attention to it. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we did some research called Clinic 20XX, where we were trying to figure out what the clinic of the future looks like. And in that case, again, we started, this was five years ago, and it's funny, Mia, because uh, a lot of the things that we published that time feel like they've come true in 2020, which has been such an unusual year in so many ways. But we had really started looking at what does outpatient care look like? Is everything going to move to the home? Is it going to stay in the hospitals? What is the role of clinics? And one of the things that was happening that time was talking about consumer-centered healthcare and thinking about patients as consumers. And when we did our poll, which was a small sample, but a nationwide poll, we found that patients, millennials and boomers, which were the two cohorts we looked at, didn't like being called consumers. So health is something where almost across both generations, they would rather be served or thought of as patients who needed health services that rather than consumers buying health services. And that's a very interesting insight that health is something that's foundational to us. Health is something that I strongly believe is a human right. And we may have gone too far in how we have consumerized health. And this year, more than any other year, has shown us that health is a public health directive. So from all of that work to all the work we did in this particular year in 2020, it's been a lot about what is public health, what is risk mitigation? How do we understand the environment? How do we leverage the environment to reduce the risks we face and to keep safety first? And most importantly, I think the message in 2020 has been this shift that we are seeing from I'm responsible to my health, which is very consumer-centered, to I'm responsible to your health, and you are responsible for mine, which is more of a public health bent of mine. So I feel we're at this pivotal point where our mindset about health is changing. I think that's really, really interesting. And I think that I completely agree about how we need to think about everyone's health as a whole and not just always be focusing on one patient or how the doctors can most efficiently do their job. We need to focus on the patients as a whole and the environment and how that plays a role. And I think it's really, really important. Exactly. Yeah. 
So kind of going along with that, especially in this year, like how important do you think it is that hospitals prioritize these design changes in rooms and in the hospitals themselves? I think it's uh, absolutely critical. It's critical because you can change staffing, you can change equipment, you can change technology, but it's very difficult to change the built environment once you are in it, right? We are starting to see like a big, big, big concern in built environments nowadays, and especially after 2020, is flexibility and adaptability. How quickly can you shift and shape shift to adopt to new circumstances? I think that's always required in healthcare. But if you haven't given enough thought early on, and I'll use the same analogy, right? If this is the theater of life, or the theater of health, and you haven't given thought to the stage, you are setting yourself up for failure in a way that you don't need to because it needs to help you. It needs to enable everyone to be better. The other thing I also think about in the environment is we always think about healthcare in the active sense, right? We think about healthcare where patients and are interacting with nurses and doctors and there is this engagement. Yet that's a very small portion of the health experience. A lot of the health experience is about waiting. Is about being by yourself. It's about being alone. And in those times, all you have is your environment. It's your family and friends who are there a lot of the time who need to be also supported by the environment. But the environment plays a key role because when you don't have the active participants, you don't have the other stakeholders, you're left with the environment. So it really needs, it needs to be able to help you in crisis mode. It needs to be super efficient and effective. It needs to be super duper functional, but it also needs to heal and be your friend and be something that's there for you when someone, other humans are not, right? So um, I think the role of the environment, both in the active engagement and in the passive engagement is very powerful. And this year, we have kind of seen all aspects of that. We have seen how you have had hospitals transform to make room for testing and for now vaccines. And you've seen all these pop-up hospitals come up. And so you, you've been able to see how quickly they're able to adapt. But when they go back to normal, that's going to be a time away. And the remnants of what we've experienced is going to be not just in the physical health, but hugely in the mental health and the opioid crisis that we're already seeing. And if we have to battle it, we have to use every single tool at our disposal. And the built environment is a key piece of that. Um, one thing that we talk about in a lot of my research, but um, in also the classes that I teach, is the idea of the design continuum. That design is a continuum that starts from information design to product, to interiors, to architecture, to the urban design, urban setting, to the city and to the policies at the very end. When you think about design as a continuum, you don't take a siloed approach. You take more of a systems thinking approach and you say, okay, this is what I'm doing in the architecture. This is what's happening in the interiors. This is what's happening in the technology. This is how I'm doing the design of the information and how the information itself is shared. And this is how my neighborhoods, my cities, and my policies are designed. And if all of those can come together interdependently, then we have a system that's designed for health, not just a building that's designed for health. That that makes a lot of sense. So going along with that and how you said that over time, a lot of people have started to research more and more, but even today and as of now, do you think that enough research is being done on this or should there still be continuing learning? I think there Mia, needs to be absolutely more research, but I think there needs to be more interdisciplinary research. The problem forever has been that we have all done research in our independent silos, and that doesn't work. So there's a great project we're doing right now, actually, with the School of Medicine, which is around point of decision design. And that one is around trying to see, uh, understand how young children, adolescents, uh, middle school age children make decisions about healthy eating and healthy activities, and how they make those decisions, and can we through design, help them at their point of decision so that we can make the healthy choice the easy choice. 
And that's a collaboration with public health, with School of Medicine, with the School of Architecture. Those are the kind of collaborations that we really, really need going forward. So we absolutely need more research. We need more design. We need more action from that research and that design in real practice. And we need to turn our back on silos because silos are not going to help us in the kind of problems we are facing today. Right. So if we go kind of back into some of the very design elements themselves, you were speaking about the study about the window with the brick wall versus the view of nature. And there were other things I was researching about, such as the lighting and the nature and like the very just distractions that patients can take away from that. So how do you think that this impacts directly the patient health and their length of stay and their recovery time? So the three things that you mentioned, access to nature, views of nature, daylighting, right? Those three are actually perhaps the most researched elements around health, right? So for all of those, like for daylight in particular, you can actually go beyond healthcare, look at schools, look at workplace, look at multiple areas and the link between daylight and reducing depression link between daylight, improving circadian rhythms and ICU recovery, link between daylight and just improved mental health, it's pretty profound. All right, so I think our right to light is a very fundamental one. Uh, And there's some new research coming out of SALK right now, which also talks about our right to darkness, which is around circadian rhythms and the fact that our devices don't let us turn off our light lives until way, way, way late in the day. So you'll see a lot of the red light, blue light research that's coming out. And so that light and dark, these fundamental human values, there's the link to health is very direct. On In terms of access to nature, views of nature, both of those are also things that have a huge body of evidence. Like I said, our own research on how it can reduce the need for medication, research on how that can increase um, or improve recovery time, research on how it can actually help with communication and sense of belonging, which is really, really interesting right now. Um, In fact, IHPI is doing a study right now with the aging population. And one of the things that they've found is those who have better access to nature and social spaces to interact safely, aging adults with better access to nature and social spaces, also report better physical and mental health, right? So um, I think those three are really, really foundational. Um, Beyond that, you'll see a lot of research on things like layout and flow, on ventilation, on simply access to other humans, so sense of connection or being able to see others, the sense of belonging, there's research on that. There's a lot of research on more pragmatic elements like infection control, fall reduction, things like that, that the environment also helps, which is why it's almost like thinking of the Maslow's pyramid. So you have a lot of research that is around safety and efficiency. Then you have a lot of research on just experience emotions, human perception, and the things that can affect that. And then a smaller amount, which I think that's really going to grow around truly feeling empowered and being proactive in your health. So the shift we are starting to see is moving from mental health to brain health, to really keeping our brains active and engaged and positive, because that can help us in our road to recovery on many, many physical issues as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, that totally does. And then just one final question before we go. You mentioned the presence of other people and kind of the social spaces. But in times like today, in 2020, with all of the events going on, patients don't have that same access to visitors and things like that. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on how that impacts the patients. This is something, Mia, we also took up in the class that I teach on health by design. It's a really interesting dilemma. But this is where design comes in. So for example, there is a difference between being spatially connected and being socially connected. It is possible to be spatially distant and socially connected. And we did all of us a disservice when we talked about social distancing. It was never social distancing, it was spatial distancing. So the 
ability to be in a space where you can see others, you can talk to others from a safe distance, balconies, windows, those in-between spaces. A lot of my recent research has really been around finding those in-between spaces that can make a community thrive, that are perfect for normal mode for health and well-being in general. But during a pandemic, or a circumstance like a pandemic, give us more human resilience? And that, I think, is a great question to end on. These are the kind of questions that we really want to take up with multidisciplinary courses like Health by Design on these wicked problems as design problems, because now I can design environments that allow me to be socially connected at multiple levels, not just being in physical proximity. I can use technology to enable that. I can use policy to enable that. And most importantly, of course, I can use the physical environment and the social environment and redesign that to think about connection at multiple levels. So that if I can't do it, if I can't be physically close to someone, I can see them, I can talk to them, I can be with them at different scales of connection. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, it was great to have you today. It was great to talk to you and hear a little bit about your thoughts and your research. Thank you. And thank you for taking this topic on. I really believe the change will come from your generation. So really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming in today.